do you have a song? My wife Caroline has lots of songs about her. Sweet Caroline by Neil Diamond. Caroline No by the Beach Boys. Caroline Yes by the Kaiser Chiefs, good local band. There's even a song by my favourite French rap artist, MC Solar, simply called Caroline, or Caroline as they say in France. But that's not really what I mean by saying, do you have a song? What I mean is, does your life have a theme tune? Is there a song that sums up your life? I know this is a bit morbid for a Sunday morning, uh, but it's the trend now at funerals for the deceased to pick a song for everyone to leave to. According to funeral directors, some of the most popular songs are My Way by Frank Sinatra, Always Look on the Bright Side of Life by Eric Idle, Simply the Best by Tina Turner, and uh, the theme tune from Match of the Day. Would you pick any of them, perhaps? Would you have one of those for the theme of your life? Apparently lots of people do. This morning we meet two songs. The first song is the Servant Song, the first of four that appear in this section of Isaiah. And they speak about this figure referred to here as my servant. The second song that we meet this morning is the song that the people sing in response to that servant. The first one sums up the life of the servant and the second one sums up the life of the people. It's what they sing about through their life. Maybe we can learn something this morning about the theme of our own lives as we look at these words together. So first of all, the servant song, verses one to nine. Now, as we look at these verses, there are two dangers. The first one is to take it straight to Jesus and miss out the original context. The second is to get so bogged down in the original context that we miss Jesus. This passage is definitely about Jesus. Jesus' disciple Matthew tells us as much in Matthew 12. In Matthew 12, he quotes this. He says, Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from them. And many followed him and he healed them. And he ordered them not to make him known. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. The quote carries on, quoting most of verses 1 to 4. But the servant in Isaiah is also clearly identified with Israel. Isaiah 41 verse 8. But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend. And we're really going to get ourselves into a bind in verses 19 to 20 if we make it just about Jesus because in Isaiah 42 19 and 20 it says who is blind but my servant or deaf but my messenger is this Jesus so what's the answer well let's look at the text together and see what we find out what do we find out about the servant well he sounds like God's people have a look at verse 1 again Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. We're told that God upholds him and that he's chosen. They're both things promised in the last chapter to God's people. The same is true in verse 4 where we're told that he'll not grow faint or discouraged. Do you remember that promise about mounting on eagles' wings? That was what's promised to those who wait upon the Lord at the end of chapter 41. He's also been called by the great creator God. He's been taken by the hand in verse 6. And again, these were all things that were told about God's people in the previous chapters. So what is going on? Is this Jesus or is this Israel, God's people? Well, the answer is both. Jesus is the God-man. He represents God to his people because he's God, but he also represents his people uh, to God because he is his people. And we have a tendency to forget this part because so often we have to defend the deity of Christ, his godness. We often forget about his humanity, his manness. He was not only true God, he was true Adam, true David, true Israel. He was all that Israel, God's people, was supposed to be. That's why we see him in the wilderness being tempted by the devil for 40 days with idolatry, putting God to the test and hunger problems with bread. But whereas Israel failed, 
Jesus passed with flying colours. Jesus was all that Israel was supposed to be. And that helps us with our passage. Is this about Israel? Yes, what Israel was supposed to be. Is this about Jesus? Yes, because he was what Israel was supposed to be. The servant is Israel, but sometimes Isaiah describes them as they are, and sometimes he describes them as they were supposed to be. And we have something to learn from both as we travel through this section of Isaiah. So what do we learn about what Israel was supposed to be and who Jesus is? Well, firstly, he has a global mission. We see this in the first few verses. He will bring justice to the nations. We're told in verse four that the coastlands, the ends of the earth, wait for his law. In verse six, we're told he will be a light to the nations. That was to do with bringing God's salvation to the ends of the earth. So Isaiah 49 verse 6, I will make you as a light for the nations, that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. There's supposed to be a sort of attractional force by Israel, bringing the nations in. Isaiah 60 verse 3, And the nations shall come to your light, kings to your brightness, the brightness of your rising. Now the closest we see to this in Israel's history is King Solomon. So 1 Kings 4, 34, and the people of all nations came to hear the wisdom of Solomon and from the kings uh, of the earth who heard of his wisdom. The king embodied the nation of Israel himself in a way, similar to how Jesus would in the future. Jesus being the true king of Israel as well. Solomon brought in the nations and he also brought in justice. Now, when we think of justice, we think of people in wigs, don't we? But when people in the Old Testament thought about justice, they thought about people in crowns. The king was in charge of justice, fairness in the nation. Again, we saw Solomon do this in incredible ways, using his wisdom to make judgments. He's usually remembered it for the way that he dealt with two mothers arguing over a child. So this uh, justice wasn't just about bringing judgment, but about ruling in fairness. But beyond Solomon, Israel failed in this role. Indeed, Solomon ultimately failed in this role. Instead of bringing salvation and justice to the nations, he ended up succumbing to the idolatry of the nations himself. Jesus, on the other hand, fulfilled this totally. He brought justice. So John 9, 39, Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world that those who do not see may see and those who see may become blind again there's that idea of fairness not that jesus won't judge he will do on judgment day when he returns and the father has handed all judgment over to him but that wasn't what he came to do in the world when he came the first time he came the first time to bring justice and he will ultimately bring that when he returns and writes all wrong and judges all wrongdoing but for now, as believers, we live under that righteous and just king, a king who is always right, a king who never does wrong. Jesus brought justice. He is also the light of the world. Jesus himself says in uh, John 8 verse 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. He is the one who brings salvation to the ends of the earth. He is the light of the world. And now he calls us to be lights to the world. Not to shine ourselves so much, but to reflect his light. The moon provides light at night, not only because, uh, not because it's light itself, but only because it reflects the light of the sun. So in Jesus, uh, so Jesus says in Matthew 5, 14, you are the light of the world. We are now to take his light to the ends of the earth. So he has a global mission that we continue. He has a global mission, but he also has a God-given mission. We're told in verse 1 that God delights in him and that God has put his spirit upon him. Now this could be applied to Israel. God promised he would put his spirit on them and the Bible elsewhere tells us that he does delight in them. But both these elements appear together at Jesus' baptism, when Jesus' mission properly began. 
in whom my soul delights, in the Greek, is in whom I am well pleased. This is what God the Father said about Jesus as the Holy Spirit descended on him as a dove. That incident is supposed to make us think of these verses and what Jesus' mission would be. He would bring justice to the nations, we've already seen that, but we're also told that he would be quiet and gentle. He'll be quiet. In Matthew's Gospel, in that ver those verses we read earlier, he links this with Jesus not making himself known like an earthly king. The way that he had no earthly majesty to attract us to him. The way that he kept his identity quiet rather than shouting about it everywhere. And this is a strange contrast to the rest of the section where we're told to shout and cry and raise our voices. What we're to see from that though is that Jesus is not self-promoting if you like. Philippians 2 6 and 7, who though he was in the very form of God did not count equality as God, with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. That was Jesus. Kings and emperors in Isaiah's day and in Jesus' day were very much into self-promotion. But Jesus was a different kind of leader. He was quiet. We're also told as well that he will be gentle. Even though he's all powerful, even though he's the true king of the world, he won't put out a candle that's about to go out. He won't break a plant that's about to be damaged. That's what it's saying in these verses. It's a picture of his meekness, his gentleness. This is an attribute of Jesus that's much underrated. Gentleness is a fruit of the spirit. It's also a qualification for leadership. We've seen so many scandals recently with leaders who weren't gentle with their people. Gentleness is not about being a pushover. Gentleness does not mean that you never challenge people. Gentleness does not mean that you don't lead people, but it does affect how you lead people. It does affect how you challenge people. Jesus knew what it was to be gentle and we have much to learn from him. We're also told in verse 6 that he will be a covenant for the people. Now that's probably the trickiest phrase in this whole section. There are about as many different takes on it as Otley has coffee shops mm -hmm. and as Ilkley has ridiculously overpriced designer clothes shops, mm -hmm. though there are some reasonably priced children's shoe shops it has to be said. The one that makes most sense though is that Jesus is the embodiment of the covenant, the greatest treaty from God to man. That treaty, that covenant, united God and man, it, it brought them together. And in him, God and man are united. In that sense, the giving of him is the giving of the covenant. Jesus himself uses similar language in the New Testament when he says at the Last, cup, at last Supper, this cup that is poured out now for you is the new covenant in my blood. His blood is the covenant. He is the covenant. No Jesus, no covenant with God. His mission was to bring in that new covenant with God and he signed that covenant with his blood. So he's that new covenant that it speaks about here. And then we're left with two more familiar images in verse seven. We're told that he will open the eyes of the blind and that he'll release captives. Now this in some ways neatly summarises Jesus' mission on earth. Not just did he open physical eyes, he opened spiritual eyes. He never sprung a prisoner out of jail, but he did side with the oppressed and outcast. Convicts and criminals were more comfortable around Jesus than moralists and self-righteous people. And there's a challenge for us in that too, isn't there? And Jesus did set people free from sin by forgiving their sin, cancelling it, paying it himself. He died on the cross to serve our sentence, to pay the penalty for his people. And in doing so, he rescued us from the clutches of hell. He released us from the destructive power of sin. Now, bearing all that's in mind, uh, bearing all this in mind, it's worth thinking where Jesus fits in this picture and where we fit in this picture. In those two images, well, Jesus is the eye-opener, isn't he? Who are we? We're the blind. Jesus is the pardoner, the great forgiver. We are the criminals, the people who've done wrong. 
Is that how you see your relationship with Jesus? Jesus is the glorious, gracious giver, and we are the receivers of that grace. We don't open our own eyes. We don't set ourselves free. He does it. We cannot do it. Now that is humbling, isn't it? But it's true. All the glory then goes to Jesus because we can't claim it anymore for ourselves. And yet we're told that God does not give his glory to another. Have a look at verse eight. I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. What it's saying here then, if, if he is getting the glory, is that this servant will not be an idol. He'll not be a rival to God. Why? Because the servant is God. God the Son, Jesus Christ. When we worship Jesus, we don't worship someone other than God. We worship God. When we give glory to Jesus, we don't rob God of his glory because Jesus is God. He's not an idol. He's not another God. He's the God of the Bible. One of the three in one, the Trinity, the Godhead. God does not share glory. Yet Jesus has it with the Father and with the Spirit. Just a reminder that Jesus is nothing like those voiceless, useless statues that we've talked about in previous weeks. He's God himself. And God has told us all this beforehand. He tells us that in verse 9. Think about that for a second. Here we are clearly discussing Jesus' mission from a text that was written about 700 years before he was born. The comparison time frame for us would be finding out that King John predicted the internet in the Magna Carta. That's the difference in time here that we're talking about. That would be inconceivable. But God did it. He talked in detail about his servant 740 years before he sent him. That's incredible, isn't it? It should remind us of the amazingness of our God and of his servant that he's spoken about so far in advance. So that's the servant and his song. What should our response be? Well, the Bible's answer is sing. So our last section, and more briefly, much brief, much more briefly, the people's song. The people's song. Have a look at verses 10 to 12. Sing to the Lord a new song, his praise from the end of the earth. You who go down to the sea and all that fills it, the coastlands and all their inhabitants, let the desert and its cities lift up their voice. The villages that Kedar inhabits, let the inhabitants of Selah sing for joy. Let them, mount it, let them shout from the top of the mountains. Let them give glory to the Lord and declare his praise to the coastlands. First we see in this the scale of the song. It's a new song. Now nowadays it seems like there's a new hymn or praise song come out every week. But in the Bible, they only have new songs when something new and awesome happens. When God does some incredible rescue or act for his people. The arrival of the servant is the cause of a new song, reminding us that something great is happening. A great act of salvation is about to come about by this servant. But it's not just a new song, it's a universal song. The ends of the earth are going to sing it. The coastlands by the sea will sing it. The pagan cities in the desert will sing it. They'll sing it from the mountaintops, we're told. What is the song? Well, it's a song giving glory and praise to the Lord, praising God the Lord, we see in verse 12. And then the passage finishes with the song that they'll sing. We see the theme of the song. Firstly, we see a God who is strong. Have a look at verses 13 to 15. The Lord goes out like a mighty man. Like a man of war, he stirs up his zeal. He cries out, he shouts aloud, he shows himself mighty against his foes. For a long time I have held my peace. I have kept still and restrained myself. Now I will go out like a woman in labour. I will gasp and pant. I will lay waste mountains and hills and dry up all their vegetation. I will turn the rivers into islands and dry up their pools. God here is described as a warrior, a soldier. 
The same imagery is used of God in the Song of Moses after he overthrows the Egyptian army in the escape from Egypt. Now we don't need to be embarrassed of this imagery. It's not saying that God is a bully or a tyrant. It's saying that God is big enough, is strong enough to stand up to bullies and tyrants. It's saying God is strong enough to rescue his people from generals and emperors and kings. He will not be pushed around. He has kept his peace. He has held himself back. But now he comes out like with a war cry, as loud as a woman in labour. And that can be loud. Laying waste to the mountains, drying up rivers and seas, as he did in the Exodus. But all his strength, all this power has a purpose. He's showing himself to his people as a God who is kind. Have a look at verse 16. And I will lead the blind in a way they do not know. In paths they have not known, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness before them into light, the rough places into level ground. These are the things I do, and I do not forsake them. At first this verse sounds a bit cruel. Why lead a blind person to a place where they don't know? But what he's doing here is rescuing them. And remember, we are the blind ones in this passage. He's leading us. He's promising to guide us, to make our way straight before us, to turn our darkness into light. So this is not cruelly leading blind people into strange places. This is God promising to guide his people, to turn their darkness into light. And he promises never to forsake them, never to leave them, never abandon them. God uses his great power to be kind to his people. And he fulfills all of this through Jesus Christ. And then the final thing we see in the theme of the song is that God is trustworthy. Have a look at verse 17. They are turned back and utterly put to shame, who trust in carved idols, who say to metal images, you are our gods. God is trustworthy. Idols can't do this, says God. You can't trust them. You can't rely on them. But you can rely on God. Those who trust in idols will end up being put to shame. But those who trust in the Lord will never be put to shame. So that is the song that we're to sing in response to the servant. That is the song we're called on to sing by God. Do you notice though, it's not about the people, it's about God. Their theme song actually is not about them at all. It's about who God is and what he's done. It's not, I did it my way. It's not, I'm simply the best. It's God did it his way, and he's simply the best. The theme of their life is God and how great he is. So I want to ask you this morning, is that the theme of your life? Is that your song? Is that the song that you'd want people to hear to sum up your life? God and his greatness. William Cooper wrote a wonderful hymn called There is a Fountain Filled with Blood. In it he says that ever since he heard of Jesus' sacrifice, redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die. That was his song. That was the theme tune to the whole of his life, God's redeeming love. William Crossman, who wrote as a poem, my song is love unknown. Well, actually, these are the words, my song is love unknown, my saviour's love to me, love to the loveless shown that they might lovely be. That was his theme tune, that was his song. What's yours? Is it all about you? I think that's another song, isn't it? McFly, I think. Is it all about you? Or is it all about God? And if you're wondering how you can make it all about him, well, we need to do what the people in the passage do. Look to God. Look to his servant. Look to the redeeming acts that he did. Look at the amazingness of all that he is. We sing it in response to him. So we look to him to make that our song. So do you have a song? Well, you do, whatever your name is. But my prayer is that it won't be about you, but about him. Let's pray. 
Father God, thank you for your servant, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, thank you that he is strong and kind. Father, thank you that he is uh, one who opens the eyes of the blind, who sets the prisoner free. Father, thank you that we follow him and we look to him. Father, help him and his redeeming love, his great acts of kindness and mercy and grace to be the theme of our life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.